make a, a start this evening. I want to give you a very warm welcome to our prayer and Bible study tonight. And just a few uh, brief announcements as we begin. Um, if you subscribe to the, the prayer line and text service, you'll have seen that the Hughes dad's funeral is taking place this Friday at 11 o'clock at Scrabble Hall. So do pray for Hugh and his family. And also, um, don't forget, Grief Share is on Friday night at 7.30 in the prayer room. And I do want to thank you as well for your prayers as a, a, um, I was speaking in men and colleagues today. Uh, so we were looking at some things that are amazing but true, and the fact of the resurrection and what that means for us today. So do continue to pray for those who heard, and, and not just the pupils, but also the teachers as well. So we're going to turn to um, God's word just now, but before we do that, let's pray together and let's ask for his help as we do so. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for your word and just for the, the fact that we can meet here tonight. Father, we uh, do pray for, um, just as your words went forth even today in that assembly, Lord, we pray that the pupils who heard and also for the, the staff as well, Lord, that they would consider the evidence, that they would think, Lord, and just in the reality of the resurrection. And that's just as I presented even those truths and the, the evidence for it, but even challenge, Lord, about that they examine it for themselves. And so, Lord, I pray that they would turn to your word, that they would even seek some of those sources I mentioned about, and that they would uh, find out the truth for themselves, that our Saviour is living, and that Father, he lives to even intercede for us as well. Father, we... I uh, do want to give you thanks for the wonderful gospel message that we have to share. A message, Lord, which gives life. A message which gives pardon. And we do want to thank you for that. And Father, help us as we even share of your word tonight. And as we pray together later as well, Lord, we ask that you would uh, be, be glorified in our meeting together. Lord, as your word is proclaimed, just may it even be helped us as we pray. May it just... And even give us some prompts to pray as well too. And so Lord, just there's a sense of your presence here with us in, in our meeting tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to turn tonight uh, in, to Second Peter 3. We're continuing our, our doxology series tonight by looking at a verse right at the very end of Second Peter. And we're looking at some of these short prayers. And we're seeing really how they can help us in our own prayer life by giving us some prompts. Uh, things that we can pray about too. So the last time we actually looked at a, a very famous benediction at the end of uh, Corinthians, uh, one you hear often, but tonight we're turning to a doxology, so a prayer, but also a note of praise to God. So the, the verse in question we're looking at is verse 18, but I want to begin reading from verse 17 of Second Peter 3. So it says, verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, Take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You know, First and Second Peter are great books of encouragement. Uh, they were written to encourage believers who were scattered due to persecution. And we see that in First Peter 1. Uh, where he, he addresses that and uh, he wrote his first letter to urge people to really to the believers to stand strong amidst the persecution and, and persevere even amidst great opposition but the way he does that is he reminds people to, of the hope that there is in Christ Jesus and even in responding to suffering he, he looks to the example of Christ and how he responded. And in this second letter, he urges them once again to look to Christ again. But he also urges them to live lives marked by holiness. And one of the issues that's behind Second Peter is there was false teaching that had arisen from some, in, in the early churches. And some of these false teachers had infiltrated some of the church. And they were, they were subtly twisting scripture really to suit their, their own ends. And, but the danger of following such false teaching was it was leading others astray. This is why Peter says in verse 17, he urges them not to, to, to watch that they aren't carried away by these lawless people and that they would lose their stability. Now, what happens if you lose your stability? You fall. You fall, and that's what he doesn't want these believers to do. He doesn't want them to, uh, they're being planted in the truth, but he doesn't want them to stumble into error. Uh, that was the danger then, and in the error, and in the sin. 
So that was a danger then, and it's still a danger today. When you think of it, we live in an age where there's, uh, well, there's certainly an abundance of teaching available even in, in, in different sources, whether it's online, or whether it's on our TV screens, or whether it's even in books as well. But some teaching, some of that teaching isn't always helpful or, or true as well. As, as, as some uh, great Bible teaching is out there, there is also some false teaching as well. And many people sometimes are subtly taken in by it too as well, particularly when they twist scripture, they take verses that are familiar, and yet either misapply them or, or lift them out of context. And that's a danger in maybe some TV channels, um, Christian TV channels, or even um, various sources online, or even sadly in some Christian bookshops as well. We have to be discerning there as well too. But what is the antidote to error and the false teaching? How can believers stay the course? Well, Peter says in verse 18, the last verse of this letter, here's like the final note that Peter wants to leave ringing in their ears. And that is, he wants them to grow. He wants these believers to grow, to make spiritual progress. You see, in the Christian life, it's a dangerous thing to st simply stand still. Now, I'm not talking about our activity in the church. That's not what I mean by standing still. But I'm talking about in our spiritual life, and our walk with God. It's important that we keep on growing. Um, our, our daughter Lydia has regular appointments with our health visitor. She comes out and... They, they check to see whether she's growing, of course, the way they do that is by checking her, her weight and they check, uh, occasionally they check how, how long she is and all as well too. And, and they do these things. Why do they do that? Because if the child is not growing, well, that's a problem. Something's wrong. And it's the same thing is true in the Christian life. If we're not growing, if we're not growing spiritually, something is wrong. You see, as believers, we can't simply rest on past blessings. Either whether it's the things that we learnt when we were in Sunday school or, or sermons that we heard from years ago. Or even quiet times maybe from some time ago which were vibrant. And yet now maybe have grown cold. If you're not still taking in God's word and if you're still not applying it to yourself in your life. That's a dangerous thing if you're not doing that. We're still to be growing. I don't just want to hear what God has said in your life many years ago. I want to hear what God is doing in your life and I. What is God saying to you and I? Or, or what is God teaching you from his word? What's he doing in your life? I want you to notice in this verse the foundation of the growth. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And, and these are two titles, Lord and Saviour, that Peter often uses here. Jesus is our Lord. He's the master who we follow and obey his commands. He's also our Saviour. The one who loves us and gives himself for us. And we follow him because we love him. Any measure of growth in the spiritual life, it's connected to our relationship with Christ. And our relationship with the Lord is something that should be always developing. It shouldn't be static. Think about maybe the first time you met your, your wife or your husband. You initially spent time with one another. You grew to know one another better. You got to know that... Maybe the kind of things they like to do, what, what they like to eat, or their interests, and, and the things even they dislike as well. You find out more about them, you even find out more about their character as well over time. But it's the same thing in our walk with the Lord. The more we, the only way to grow in Him is to, is to spend time with Him, to spend time with Him in His Word, and to spend time not only reading the Word, but listening to it, and also seeking to follow it. And spend time with the Lord regularly in prayer. That's the only way that we can grow. And what kind of things does, does Peter say are, are measures of growth? Uh, we know how to measure a growth in a, in a person. But what about measuring our spiritual growth in the Lord? Well he gives us two clear measures here. And the first is to grow in grace. Growing in Christ means growing in grace. And sometimes we think of grace only being about our conversion. Um, think of it, the number of hymns you know even about grace, think of some, I mean, an obvious example comes to mind, Amazing Grace, a sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me, talks about grace that saves, there's many others as well, who's that 
poor, coarse, wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve. It's thinking more about um, even our, our, our conversion and the grace God has shown us. But also, grace isn't just about conversion. Because grace is also, we need to be sustained by God's grace. Daniel Aiken remarks, Peter presents grace not as a static reality limited to the time when we first confess Christ and were forgiven, but as a dramatic, dramatic, sorry, dynamic infusion of God's help. Grace is an infusion of God's help for living the gospel life from beginning to end. He's thinking there are sustaining grace. Grace sustains, grace keeps us. Like the verse in 2 Corinthians we looked at a few weeks ago, Paul was a man who was always gripped by grace. He talks about grace often in his letters. And Peter does much the same. If you look back to this, the beginning of 2 Peter, you'll see that. Look at verses 2 to 4. In verse 2, Peter really begins this second letter talking about grace. He says, "Grace, May grace and peace be multiplied in you in the knowledge of God and in Jesus Christ our Lord. He wants grace and peace to be multiplied. But then he goes on to show how this grace is shown to us. Verses 3 to 4. His divine power has granted to us. He's granted us to that in his grace. All things that pertain to life and godliness. So God gives us power even to live for him as well. He gives us that sustaining grace. So we can enjoy, verse 4, his precious and very great promises. We need grace. Peter talks about this grace. You know, when you think of it, we are strengthened by God's grace. This knowledge of God's grace even helps us endure amidst difficult times. One famous verse about grace in the Bible, of course, is, remember when Paul talked about his thorn in the flesh? And he struggled with that thorn in the flesh. He, he, he even prayed three times about it as well, and that the Lord would remove it from him. But yet, he, the Lord, he says, Encourage them with these words. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. God's grace is sufficient. It's grace that strengthens. It's grace that even helps us endure. But how do you practically grow in grace? Well, when you think of it, the, um, the, even God gives us grace in so many ways. Even the church, through the church as well, gathering as believers, even as it's, it's a great help in God's grace. It's a means of grace. Because God gives us, he unites us as believers. As believers, we come to hear the word proclaimed. We come to pray together. That too is a means of grace because it encourages us. It encourages us. It helps us. We even, you know, just celebrate God's grace when we spend that time in communion together. We can help one another grow in grace. The Lord can use trials also to help us grow in grace. Though difficult, though, uh, trials can teach us patience. They can even humble us as well. Wearsby remarks, we can never really experience the grace of God until we're at the end of our own resources. We can never experience God's grace until we're at the end of our own resources. He says the lessons learned in the school of grace are always costly lessons, but they're worth it. But how can we know more? Of the grace of God. How can we grow in that grace? Well it's linked with the next one. Verse 18. Grow in the grace. And what comes next? The knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Peter actually said the very same thing. Didn't he at the very beginning of Second Peter. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. What came next? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ the Lord. That's how even you grow in grace. The two are very tightly linked. But you know, when Peter talked about the, some of the marks of these false teachers that were coming into the church, he described them as being blind. Because there were people who Christ, it says they forgot almost that Christ could cleanse them from their sins. These were believers who had gone off the path. And that was not how they were living. They were not living those lives marked by holiness. He goes on in this letter to talk about how they're deceiving themselves in their own spiritual state. They were also ignoring even the fact that God's judgment was going to come upon them. In short, they were, they were unstable people. And that's not how Paul wants the believer to be. He wants part of this growing instability is even growing in the knowledge of the Lord. In his first letter, Peter urges his readers in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow. 
Peter isn't saying just know your Bible. No, because people, people in a secular university can go and learn theology. They can even quote your verses of scripture, but yet not know the Lord. Have you ever met someone who's not a Christian, and yet maybe they've been, maybe from all those years of Sunday school or whatever, they can actually quote the Bible? They can quote the Bible sometimes better than some Christians can, actually. But yet they don't truly know the Lord. So it's not just a matter of knowing what the Bible says. It's a matter of also doing it and letting that knowledge draw you closer to the Lord as well. Peter says, notice what Peter says in that verse, 1 Peter 2, 2. Desire the pure milk of the word. You see, true spiritual growth, it involves delighting in God's word. And craving it with the similar way that a baby would crave milk as well. We're to have that hunger for God's word. But how do you how do we cultivate this desire for God's word? We cultivate the desire for God's word. And there's there's four things I want to list here. We can develop this desire when we remember the quality of God's word. It's a life giving. It's life giving. These words Scripture are God breathed, given by inspiration of God. They're good, they're, they're profitable for instruction, for correction, to guide us even in the way we should go. These words are able even to pierce to the very depths of our heart. When you truly appreciate something's quality and something's value, you want to, to take it in and you know how good it is. The second thing is, we develop this desire when we remove any hindrance. There might be hindrances stopping us desiring God's word as we ought to. Maybe if we're, if we're feeding on the wrong things in our life. When we remove any hindrance of sin in our life. And that, that could be deadening our hearts even to receiving that word. If we're spending more time, you know, feasting on things that we shouldn't be feasting. And it can can harden our heart even to the voice of God in our life. It can stop even our prayers being answered. The third thing and how we develop this desire is when we admit our need to God for this truth. When we respond to that word even to God in prayer and admit our need of it. Because we do need it. As a Christian you cannot grow without the word, God's word in your life. Because that's how God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. But also the fourth way you can truly desire God's word is when you taste of it. Like when you've tasted something wonderful. Like when you've sat down, when you sit down to a lovely meal. If you go out to a restaurant or something somewhere and, and someone sits down at a plate of food and you know you've had you've had that thing, something like you know, where say the person you've ordered a meal and maybe yours is okay, you've tasted it theirs, and it's like, oh boy, that's good. <laughs> and what happens is is usually one one bit of it enough. You know, if something tastes lovely, if it's beautiful, you, you, you might go, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just try another wee bit of that. Once you've truly tasted something, you, you develop that desire for it. You develop that desire for it. And this is true, God and his word. This word, when this word inflames our hearts, when it stirs our affections, it should draw us deeper into our walk with the Lord. We should desire it more. If we've truly tasted of it, it should, we should be hungering for that word. We grow in the knowledge of the Lord not only when we know what he requires of us and when we know him better, but we grow when we obey and put his word into practice in our life. We grow not just when we read it, when we listen to it, but when we obey it. You have to put the word into practice. It's no good just reading that word and then just walking away unchanged. But growth in grace and knowledge, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it takes a lifetime takes a lifetime. See, what Peter's saying is rooted in Christ. You know, he's talking about moving in the right direction, moving towards the Lord. You know, that journey, as the journey, as I said, takes a lifetime. And it's important we're headed in the right direction. And that direction is grounded in the gospel. And we, we can't ever graduate from the gospel. We never move away from it. In a relationship with the Lord, we only grow deeper in our understanding of it. And, and there's aspects of it we'll never fully fathom as well. But we should want to grow in the gospel. But there's a great danger in the Christian life. And that danger is growing stale in our Christian walk. 
particularly if we're living on past blessings or past achievements, past spiritual achievements, and not growing in the present. You know, do we ever say to ourselves, well, you know, I've done this for the Lord, or, or I brought that person along to church, or I pointed this person to Christ, or, or I served the Lord as a Sunday school teacher. And, but, but where are you today? Where are you today with the Lord? Are we growing? Are we standing still? Ask yourself tonight, can we honestly say that we know the Lord better now than we maybe did six months ago or a year ago? Or are we growing maybe a bit more distant, a bit more maybe lukewarm? Notice there that grace comes before knowledge. See, in the Bible, the only way to, to come to know God is the grace which he shows us in the first place. By opening our eyes to the truth of the gospel, preparing our hearts. We need both grace and knowledge. We need them both. If we agree in knowledge but not in grace, then we become proud and puffed up and ungracious. But it's a beautiful thing that we have both of these. And that not only builds up ourselves but builds up others as well. Both things require effort. You know, in the 18th century, there was an English preacher, a man named John Fletcher. And he drew up a list to, to encourage people to think about, you know, how is my walk with the Lord? And he, he wrote down a number of these questions. He says, yeah, let me just list some of them. He says, have I got nearer to God this day in my times of prayer? Or have I given in to a lazy idle spirit? Has my faith been weakened or strengthened by this day? Have I denied myself in all unkind words and thoughts? Have I made the most of my precious time as far as I was able to? What have I done for God's people? Have I governed well my tongue this day? Do my life and conversation give glory to the gospel of Christ? John Fletcher came up with some of those questions. He's, he's many of them there. But he, he gave these little prompts to himself and to his people so that they would think and they would examine themselves and, and to really prevent them from, from doing what some of the, the readers were in danger of doing in this letter. Those who had grown stale, those who were in danger of moving away from that stable ground of God's truth, he was urging them to examine themselves, to, to not just stand still, but go forward in the Lord. And you know, this is an exhortation we all need to listen to. But notice finally, the very last bit, the goal and purpose of our growth and knowledge and grace. It's not that people would look at us and say, what a great Christian we are. No, that's not it. The goal is that we would, they would say, what a great saviour we serve. Remember the words of John the Baptist. He said, <coughs> He must increase, but I must decrease. But is not that something that's true of every believer? It should be our desire that Christ would be made much of in our lives and that less of ourselves. But there's something different in this, gene uh, not the genealogy, doxology. Look at it again. To him be the glory both now. Now what normally would you expect to see in a genealogy? What's normally in there? To him be the glory both now and most of them usually say forever, don't they? But this one doesn't. To the day of eternity. You might say, what's all that about? Well, well, Peter is always mindful. One of his things in his letters is, and particularly this second letter, he talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord, a day when people will be held accountable. They'll be, they'll be given account for how they've lived. And, and really what Peter is saying at the very end of his letter you know, live with the light of Christ's return in mind. Remember that one day, actually, when Christ returns, and he's going to return in judgment again one day as well, there'll be that day of judgment. He's thinking of that day of judgment here in view. Live in light of that. Remember that one day we're going to have to give an account. Have we grown in the Lord? Or have we simply, simply stayed still where we are? So tonight, as we come to prayer, let us pray for our own spiritual growth. It's a good thing to pray for that. Not just pray for physical needs, but to pray for our spiritual needs for one another. That we would grow in grace. That we would grow in knowledge. 
a good, a good thing to pray about that as individuals, but also pray about it together, as corporately as a group. So I pray that this would help us as we pray, but also that God would be glorified in us as a church. That as people look at our lives, that we would see more of Christ and less of us. You know, next week I'm going to consider looking at one of the most famous benedictions of all from the Old Testament. I'll leave that mystery with you. I'm sure you, you probably guessed what one that is, maybe. Already, you can let me know at the door if you have. But that's the one I'm thinking of maybe looking at next week, unless I'm diverted otherwise. But well, that's what I, what I hope to do. But I do hope this little series is just helpful in our prayer life as well, just to give us a few little prompts to pray. And so let's pray together. Let's respond to God now as we um, respond to this, this verse. Heavenly Father, we do want to give thanks for the grace that you've shown us. Grace which not only saves us, but grace which keeps us. But Father, help us to grow in grace. To grow just in getting a glimpse of the grace that you've shown us. To depend on the grace that strengthens us. But also to show grace even to others as well too. Father, help us to do this. Help us, Lord, also to grow in knowledge. And may this knowledge not just be a head knowledge, but a knowledge that impacts our heart. Help us, Lord, to live out even your word as well in our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to be like those signposts pointing to Christ Jesus. Help us to do that as a church, as individuals. And Lord, just help us never to get lax about our own spiritual growth, but even to consider, Lord, have we grown even in this last six months or, or year? Is our relationship with you closer? And if not, Lord, just May we take that time tonight to confess that before you. But also to take corrective measures, Lord, and spending maybe that time with you in your word, and that time with you in your in prayer. Help us now, Lord, as we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.